dignitaries from the university, uh, the distinguished guest lecturer for today, Professor Dr. Kaushik Majumdar, Professor of System Science and in Informatics, Indian Statistical Institute, Bengaluru. Uh, hearty welcome to Sri M. N. Uh, Vidya Shankar, Co-Chairman Bites. Uh, our uh, Honorable uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor K. N. P. Murthy, sir, who is uh, our uh, Vice Chancellor as well as the Chairman for Bites. Uh, hearty welcome to Dr. Putmadapa C, Registrar DSU. Uh, hearty welcome to Dr. M. K. Banga, sir, Dean Research DSU. Uh, hearty welcome to all our deans, principals, HODs, chairpersons, faculty members, staff, students, research scholars who have joined the program. Myself, uh, Dr. Anupama Ji, Assistant Registrar, uh, Research Cell DSU, and Associate Professor SCMSPG, welcomes uh, each participant for this uh, distinguished guest lecture being conducted by Bytes and DSU. Over to Dr. Bangasar. I would uh, request Dr. M.K. Bangasar, Dean Research DSU, to kindly take over the proceedings from here on. I also have with us Dr. Sharvari, uh, Professor Sharvari, who will be assisting me with the comparing at the end of the session for taking on the question. Uh, we welcome Dr. M.K. Bangasar, Dean Research DSU, to kindly take over, sir. Uh, uh, Dr. Anupama, I think uh, Professor uh, uh, Majimdar is here as well. Uh, I let him write. Are there other ideas you have today? Yes, sir. He just called. So I think he has sent you the mail also. Uh, but I think uh, since he didn't get a reply, I have forwarded the mail and also requested Professor uh, Mr. Impias to kindly include him as well. I'm already online. Oh, hello. Good morning, hello. sir. Good yeah, morning. hello. Yeah, I'm already online. Okay, okay, all right. It's wrongly showing me to uh, Dr. Odupama, but... So it's showing Dr. Anupama's name for uh, yeah, Kaushik yeah. sir as well. So I think he it, the login is through her, her ID, that's why. He has joined us and as Dr. Anupama itself. Professor uh, Majid, yes, please. The post -wise, uh, so that we can upload the PPT. I cannot hear you properly. Uh, you will be made the host so that we can upload the PPT. Okay. A PPT is open in my my system. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I probably need to share the screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Please share the screen, professor. Yeah. Shall I take over? No, just a minute, Professor. I have got yeah, okay. uh, the customary introduction. Uh, yeah, it has come up, Professor. Good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, good morning to uh, the Vice Chairman and our Vice Chancellor, Professor K.N.D. Murthy, and uh, 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Bonga, for uh, this gracious uh, introduction. Uh, let me start with the with the with the lecture right away. So, can you uh, see my PPT? Can uh, can you yes, see my PPT? We can see your PPT. Okay, and uh, am I audible clearly? Oh yes. Am I audible? Yeah, uh, because I'm not using a separate separate microphone, just uh, my laptop's audio system I'm using. Is it okay? Yeah. Or shall I? Uh... Can you put it here? Uh, okay. Yes, sir. It's, it's okay. clear. Fine, sir. Okay. 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 So the topic of today's talk is computational neuroscience modeling from intelligence to artificial intelligence. Intelligence means, here I mean the normal intelligence, natural intelligence that we all have, not just human beings, but many other animals, if not all, okay? So even an insect has intelligence and um, humans are, you know, uh, I mean, pretty hard pressed to mimic that intelligence by computer. So brain and science, Brain science, I mean, this is a relatively new concept. 100 years ago, there was not much about it. It just started. But gradually, as we, as we, as we uh, came to know more about brain science, it threw more questions than we could answer. Okay. So now, it has become in the 21st century, it has become the greatest challenge of science. I mean, the 21st century, the, the, the greatest challenge is to understand how brain works. 
Once we understand the brain, we will be able to, I mean, reevaluate our understanding about the science. Because our brain is first, and then comes the science. The science that we understand, all making of the brain, the way the brain understands the universe, that is the science. So how brain makes this understanding, if that is progressed further, I mean, becomes deeper, more insightful, that will have obvious implications on the whole understanding of science. Brain is a, of course, is a part, I mean, is an organ of our body, just like hand and feet, uh, just, I mean, is another organ, but very special kind of organ in the sense that brain has cells which are pretty different from other cells in our body. These are called nerve cells. Of course, nerve cells are there in our in, in other parts of our body. For example, in the spinal cord, nerve cells are there. Okay. In eyes, nerve cells are there. But in brain, the intelligence that we have are thought to be because of the nerve cells. Although this concept is changing, but predominantly it's because of nerve cells than other cells. The characteristics of these nerve cells are, uh, for example, it's electrical firing. Most of the nerve cells are capable of firing electrical potentials. Okay. So electrical potentials, they, they fire and uh, that actually transmit it to other nerve cells and communicate among themselves. So that is one key feature of uh, engendering intelligence that can be said. So by brain, we understand the human brain. This is the human brain, this is, a, this is the frontal part and this is the, the, the back side of the brain, okay. So the brain is basically, it's the upper, upper surface of the brain. I mean, whatever, whatever happening is a solid, it's a solid body. So whatever is happening, whatever is there inside, I mean, deep inside the solid body is not that much of a concern. Of course, there are some important, uh, important parts of the, uh, of the, I should not say brain because by, by brain, I will understand only the, the uppermost layer, the uppermost layer, which is called cortex. Cortex means just a thin layer, kind of bark. Okay. So this is the cortex, the uppermost layer, which is in human brain, nowhere thicker than more than four millimeters. Okay. So that is the, that, that is the part called gray matter, where the nerve cells are, uh, uh, nerve cells are networked. So that gray matter is believed to be the source of all the intelligence in the mammals. The other, the, the other uh, type of animals like, like reptiles, like birds, like fish, like amphibians, like insects, they don't have this cortex, this gray matter, the, the outer layer of the brain. Okay. But that doesn't mean that they are not intelligent. They have their intelligence in a different way. But for the mammals, including humans, the intelligence is predominantly housed in this cortex. So that is a new evolution, a new revolution in uh, intelligent thinking. And humans are at the top in the sense that evolutionarily, humans are the, the, the latest mammal, you can say. And uh, that's why the human brain is the end result, you can say, of evolutionary, evolutionary intelligence, and therefore probably the most intelligent brain in the world. So these are the nerve cells, as you can see, this is the body of the cell, and these are the dendrites through which the inputs are coming into the nerve cell. Inputs means mainly uh, the electrical firing from the other cells. And output is going out this way. This is the axon. This is the axon. Outputs are going out this way. 
So these are, I mean, again, these are called axon end feet. So axon end feet, they are actually uh, connecting to the next neurons, you know, dendritic trees, these dendrite, these dendrites. So axon and dendrites join at, at some point, and those joints are called synapses. Okay. Like this. Okay. So these are the so these are the uh, I mean places where the joints takes place. And and these joints are called synapses. So we'll come to that later. Now, here there is a there is a comparison between the mouse brain. Mouse is also another mammal, and this is human brain. What you can you can see distinctively is the wrinkle in the human brain. Okay. So the wrinkles in the human brain, okay, which you don't see in mouse brains, rather flat, more plain. Why the wrinkles are there? Because in human brain, you need to, you need to, I mean, accommodate larger uh, surface area of cortex than in the mouse brain, because lot more stuff, lot more nervous cells, lot more complicated network has to be accommodated within a small space. This is a key to, I mean, higher human intelligence than other animals. So human brain is wrinkled to accommodate more stuff into it. We'll come to that later also towards the end of the slide to show you one very interesting thing. Now, the computational neuroscience starts with the try to understand the brain in terms of mathematical and computational modeling. That is the heart of computational neuroscience, right? As you know, computation nowadays is, is in every science. There is computational chemistry, computational physics, computational social science, computational economics. So every science has application of computers, okay? So that's why in biology, it's in a big way, in a huge way. So computational modeling in, in neuroscience is also uh, a very prolific area of research where you need to do mathematical modeling of different brain functions or brain structures also. You need to do mathematical modeling and you solve those modeling. Most of the cases, those modelings are very complicated, not like uh, I mean, two body motion I mean, in Newtonian mechanics, where you have very beautiful mathematical equations and you have direct form of solutions. Most of the computational modeling of neuroscience, they do not allow you direct form of solution. So only way you can, you can approach them by numerical solution. And here the computation plays uh, a, a very vital part, you can say principal part, okay. So by making a numerical solution, you, you need to uh, infer about various things and verify uh, about very, various things. So one of the first computational models was to study the, the kind of electric signal generated from the nerve cells. As we already have discussed that nerve cells communicate with each other by electrical signals. So it was, I mean, it was a question, a, a, a deep question in those days, in, I, I would say 1920s, when this electrical signal was first visualized. That is, the electrical signal was fed into an oscilloscope and its image was visualized. Exactly how the electrical signal looks like. So it appeared that electrical signals that are coming from a single nerve cell having this shape in unit, I mean, 
those signals are consisting of pulses like this. So this is one single pulse, okay? So any electrical signal coming out of a single nerve cell is composed of multiple pulses like this, okay? So that is called action potential train or pulse train that electrical signals coming out of the nerve cells. Now, how each single pulse looks like? So each single pulse looks like this. It will first go up, then after reaching at a certain, certain value, it will go down, it will go down further, it will go further down from where it started, and then again it will come back to this position. And Sometimes, not always, it will again start from here to generate the next pulse. Sometimes the next pulse will come quite some time after. Okay, so what is the mystery behind it? Why it, it, the shape is so complicated? It's not just a straight line or, or I mean, much simpler shape. Why so, so complicated? So a detailed study was undertaken in Cambridge University by two scientists, Hodgkin and Huxley. They came up with a model after 13 years of study, they came up with a model, okay? And they published a seminal paper in 1952 in Journal of Physiology. There they described, this was actually, uh, there was a series of five papers. So in the fifth paper, they described, they described completely uh, the mathematical model that is responsible for generating this shape of the pulse. So that model, uh, we don't have scope of going into the detail of that model, but, but that is a quite fascinating study. That, that, uh, uh, that model uh, was actually, that uh, discovery of that model actually awarded by a Nobel Prize in 1961, I think. Okay, so this is called Hodgkin-Huxley model, very famous model. Uh, you can say the most successful mathematical model in neuroscience so far if not in the whole biology. This has been the most successful mathematical model. Okay. So that is Hodgkin-Huxley model. So with that model, it is believed that computational neuroscience started. Then came modeling many other things in the brain. Okay. So before that, let me, let me just make one thing uh, very clear. The brain works through electrical signal, electrical signals are generating chemical signals, chemical signals are again generating electrical signals, electrical signals are again generating chemical signals. So it is electrical, chemical, electrical, chemical sequence through this kind of information uh, transmission, signal transmission, the brain works. Okay, so briefly, uh, this is the nerve, I mean, this is one nerve cell. So here you see the inputs are coming from uh, another nerve cell falling on this nerve cell. And then this nerve cell is generating some electrical uh, signals and uh, some electrical signal and, 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 and those signals are emanating out of the output of this nerve cell. So typical signals that a nerve cell sends looks like this. So each of these is called a pulse or action potential whose shape we just saw. Okay. And this is the signal generated by the by this nerve cell. So information is contained in, not in the shape of the pulse, but how they are appearing over the time, or uh, I mean, you can say the, the gap between the appearance of pulse trains, that contains the information. The information is contained in this gap, in this gap, in this gap, okay? Not in the individual pulses. That is one important thing to understand. Now, next, what is happening? We have to look into the computational unit in the brain. So that happens to be consisting of several thousands of neurons. Okay. And they are organized along the cortical columns. So we already have discussed that cortex is a structure, is a, is a, is a kind of wrinkled surface, a structure which has thickness from two to four millimeters in different parts of the brain. 
uh, thickness is not uniform. Some, some part of the thickness is more, some other part thickness is less, but two to four millimeters. And in, and, 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 uh, in the neocortex part, that is the cortex that is sitting on the top surface, that is, there is another part called archi cortex. I'm not talking about that. Archi cortex is sitting much deeper inside. So uh, forget about archi cortex, the neocortex part. In the neocortex part, there are six layers. Okay. So I'm not going into the detail of the layers, but you just imagine the cortex you are taking uh, the, the, along the thickness. I mean, small, small patches. Okay. Those patches are typically say one point, I mean 0 0.5 to 1.5 millimeter in diameter across the thickness of the cortex. So here there are six, six layers I have shown. So the entire thickness is covering some four millimeter, uh, four millimeter height. And you see the neurons, the nerve cells are organized in these ways. Okay. So they are connected in this way and that way they are making a columnar organization in the cortex that each individual column, they are working as computational units of the brain. Okay. And those computational units are making up different brain regions. So this is the human brain, this is the frontal part, this is the uh, rear part, occipital part. And you see the, the numbered regions. So, uh, this is the uh, this is the left side of the brain and this is the right side of the brain so these are the numbered regions okay so different numbered regions they are devoted to different specialized tasks let me let me uh, give you one example so this is called broca's region broca's region is responsible for speech generation now i'm 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 lecturing in this in this uh, or, i mean in this program okay so each word I'm speaking, each sentence I'm speaking, I'm able to speak because, my, because of my Broca's region in my brain, on the left side of my brain. If the Broca's region is damaged, then I'll be able to think of what I want to say, but I won't be able to say. Okay. And that, that region was the first one uh, was the first one discovered in the brain in 1860s by one French neurologist, Paul Broca. He was basically a psychologist. In those days, there was no branch called neurology. Uh, he, was, he was basically a psychologist. Uh, he was a doctor and, and a psychologist. So he identified this uh, region of the brain, which is responsible for making uh, somebody talk. Okay. So that is called Broca's region. 10 years, roughly 10 years after in 1871 or so, another uh, doctor from Germany, his name was Wernicke. He identified another brain region, as you can see, the Wernicke's region, which is also on the left side of our brain, but much behind Broca's region. So this region is responsible for formation of the speech. The meaningful sentences, this region is responsible for uh, I mean, making meaningful sentences in our brain. Okay, if this region is damaged, if Wernicke's region is damaged, but, but Broca's region is, is, is functioning normally, then what will happen? The person will keep talking, but the talk will have no meaning. It will be useless talking. Because the way he or she will be, uh, will be uh, making the speech will be basically a random, uh, I mean, random organization of words. There will be no grammar, no meaning, because the person is unable to form speech. Okay. So these two are very important regions in our brain, identified very early. And then gradually, uh, I mean, different regions were identified. So there, there, they are called Broadman's regions. Uh, Broadman was one neurologist in 1909. He, he identified 52 different regions of human brain devoted to different types of tasks. Next, I mean, I would uh, 
want to highlight some significance of computational modeling uh, in, in, in neuroscience. So here we see Dainwright. I mean, Dainwright means this one. You see, every uh, this T branch like of structure that you are seeing, uh, they are they're part of a nerd cell. They're not the whole nerd cell, even small part of a nerd cell. So that has been uh, elaborated here. Okay. So this is Dainwright, a, 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 a branch of a Dainwright. And here you see, this is called dendritic boudon. Boudon, basically, uh, they, they make joints with, they make joints with other dendrites or other synapses, you can say, not dendrites, but synapses. I mean, uh, axonal end fit, okay. So this is, these boudons actually are part of the synaptic joint. These boutons are part of synaptic joint. Through these, the signals are accepted in the brain, right? Okay. So synaptic joints are very important. Through, I mean, they are the they are the gateway of signal trans, uh, transmission. Okay. But these boutons themselves are very complicated. Uh, I mean, biophysical structures. Okay. And they're very small of the order of uh, micrometers. So those boutons, I mean, they have complex dynamics evolving within the bouton, within the, the organ itself. So those complex dynamics, many parts of those dynamics are actually still out of reach of modern technology. We really can't reach there to see exactly what is happening. That's why there are many things happening at the say molecular level, which you need to do modeling. Whatever information you have, with the help of those information, you need to do modeling so that you can understand the whole picture and you can make inference what's going to happen next by virtue of that model. That's why modeling is not just of mathematical interest. Modeling is not just of, uh, uh, they are not just for publishing papers, but they are of real interest. They are, they are to complement the effort of the clinical scientists who are working in weight lab, generating a lot of data. The modeler's task is to make sense of those data, take those data, make model, and tell about things which are not immediate, immediately visible. Okay, so that is also a, a, a crucial part, a very important part of modeling. So that's why computational neuroscience is also, uh, I mean, extremely important for the uh, neuroscientists, the clinical neuroscientists, the experimental neuroscientists who are working in the weight lab or with the patients. So here there is one glimpse of that modeling. So this, uh, this is basically, I, I won't go into the detail. This is basically uh, concerned about tripartite synapse. That means here, here is a connection that this is a synaptic connection. So this whole structure is synapse. This is called presynaptic branch and this is called postsynaptic branch. So this is presynaptic, this is bringing signal from the presynaptic neuron from one neuron, which is situated somewhere here. And that is, that is sending the signal to this neuron. There is another neuron sitting somewhere here. So that, that neuron is receiving the signal through this synapse, okay. And this synapse, how, how well this synapse will work, I mean, uh, with, with, with uh, how much you can say, that the dynamics that is going on inside the synapse, synapse, how that dynamics will work, the entire dynamics is controlled by another type of cell called astrocytes, okay? This is called glial, I mean, these are glial cells. Astrocytes are not like nerve cells. They are different kind of, uh, kinds of cells. 
Uh, I'm not going to describe in detail what they exactly do, but astrocytes have a very important role in controlling the neuronal signaling, how the signaling will transmit from one neuron to another, that is controlled by astrocytes to a good extent. Okay. So astrocytes are also thought to be uh, important in making intelligent thinking. Okay. So that's a, that's a very, uh, you know, uh, that's the frontier research areas nowadays. That's a very frontier research area nowadays. So this has been modeled here and that modeling has been uh, done like this. So this is a p-synaptic neuron and this is the calcium. So this calcium ion is a very important, uh, very important chemical substance. The calcium ion controls how different synaptic chemicals, okay, called neurotransmitters. Uh, the, I mean, how they will bind with each other, that is controlled by calcium ion, okay. And those calcium ion concentration is controlled by the astrocytes. I mean, very superficially saying, not going into the technical detail, very superficially saying, we can try to understand like this. So that is controlled by the astrocytes and that has to be modeled in order to understand how the synapse is functioning. So if the synapse, for example, if the synapse functioning change, then the way we remember things, way we recall things, way we learn things will change. Because the memory that is stored in our brain is dependent on synapses, not the nerve cells. Okay. So if the synapses do not I mean, function properly, even in some part of the brain, so that may give rise to some pathological conditions, some brain disease. Now, we are coming to uh, working memory. So, some modeling of working memory. I mean, uh, here you see, this is the, this is a brain structure. And uh, this is called a uh, principal sulcus. Sulcus, uh, sulcus means this uh, valley, uh, I mean, valley like uh, structure that you see in the brain wrinkles, that is called sulcus. And this mounted like structure that you see, the, uh, this is called gyrus. Okay. So, gyrus and sulcus, they are make up of the cortical surface. So, what is working memory? First, let me tell a little bit about what working memory is. Um, let us take an example. We want to add 29 and 25. So we, we started at we start adding like a small kit, just learning arithmetic. So we write uh, 25 below 29 and then add 9 plus 5 equal to 14. So we write 4 over there and take 1 as carry to add to the next significant digit, that is 2. So 2 plus 2 plus 1 equal to 5, so it's 54. Now, once you do this addition, you completely forget about what was the carry after adding the first digits, that is 9 plus uh, 5. Okay, there was a carry 1. After you finish the addition, you completely forget about the carry. But when you are doing the addition, at the right at the time of doing the addition, you have to remember the carry, right? This is a typical example of working memory. The memory that you require in order to execute this task. We are executing certain task at hand. Right at the time of execution of that task, you need to have some memory which you will no longer need after finishing of the task. That is typically called working memory. Okay, so computer has it, what, what is, I mean, what sits in the RAM, but human brain also has it. And the working memory is, is as you can understand, it's a, it's a really short term memory and uh, it, it, is, it is 
housed in the frontal part of the brain. Okay, so the part that is ahead of this uh, principal sulcus. So that is called prefrontal cortex. Okay, so this white area and prefrontal cortex is actually responsible for analytical thinking, decision making. For example, you are trying to solve a mathematical problem. So your frontal part of the brain will be very active. This task is mainly taken uh, at the frontal part of the brain. Okay. So here there is a, I mean, this is actually experimental. This is a, this is a very famous experiment by uh, Patricia Goldman Racky. And she came up with a paper in 1995 in Neuron. Okay. So there uh, she demonstrated in monkey brain how working memory is stored in the monkey brain. Monkey is shown a uh, certain thing routinely, quite a few times. Monkey has been shown a certain thing and then it was not shown. So monkey had to uh, wait for it. Monkey, I mean, after, uh, after showing the monkey a few times, the monkey got, got habituated seeing that particular scenario, okay? Seeing that particular scene. So when it was not shown suddenly, the monkey started expecting that when it will appear. At that time, it was it was it was studied. It was found that certain neurons. Okay, I, I mean in this case, one particular neuron. In this case, one particular neuron has been uh, imaged. So you see this this is the firing of a, of, of one neuron. Okay. So when the monkey was not shown, when the monkey was seeing that particular uh, object, the neuron was not firing. The moment the monkey stops seeing that object, the neuron starts firing. So this is one example of how the working memory is stored. I mean, the short-term memory in order to keep that short-term memory alive in the brain, certain neurons are to fire. Okay, so that is one, one, uh, one cellular level of uh, organization of, uh, I mean, preserving the working memory for only for a few seconds that you, that you need it. So that was done in terms of firing of neurons. So the firing of neurons, I mean, when it is, uh, I mean, let, let me go to the next slide. How firing of neuron can make a real life representation of certain scene. This is from an artificial neural network. I mean, it has good similarity with the, with the biological phenomenon that I have shown. Okay. So this is a neural network, basically. This is basically a neural network. So there is, a, there is an image, image of a car. So image consists of pixels, as we all know, right? So think of the neural network, which is taking that image as an input. So there will be as many input nodes as there are pixels. So each pixel is being represented in terms of, uh, in terms of firing of a neuron, that the intensity of the pixel is actually driving the firing of the neuron. So as the pixel becomes intense, the intensity varies, the firing, firing rate also varies in that neuron, okay. So the firing rate, monitoring the firing rate over the time, so t equal to one means the first second, t equal to five is the fifth, fifth second, t equal to 10 is the 10th second, t equal to 50 is the 50th second. So during this time, the neuron is firing, okay. So the neuron is firing and firing pattern is changing according to the pixel intensity. This is a still image, the pixels are fixed, pixel intensities are fixed, but in, in different pixels, the intensities are different, so firing rates will also be different. Okay, now over the time, 
the the firing rate that you are getting if you superpose them together if you add them together then what will happen you will superpose all these images i mean this image this image this image so eventually you will get this image as you see the more time you are spending the more realistic image you are getting just from firing of the neurons so this is a very good you can say a neural network implementation of the brain function of preserving working memory in terms of firing neurons okay so that also gives us a clue of how working of brain can guide us to create artificial intelligence in terms of modeling so computational neuroscience is not just helping to understand the brain but also contributing in ai artificial intelligence once we understand the brain functioning of brain in terms of mathematical modeling we have the immediate opportunity of implementing that model into computer in order to replicate that function of the brain the virtual virtual brain functioning okay the virtual functioning of the brain the moment we are able to do that we are in a position to get things done by that functioning to operate some robot by that functioning an artificial intelligence is immediately put into practice so so far we are talking about the modeling at the cellular level okay now we will talk about modeling at the system level that is the whole brain level okay modeling at the whole brain level so in human brain uh, per se in human brain there are of the order of 10 to the power 11 number of neurons and each neuron is roughly i mean on an average i mean there are neurons uh, which are only connected to few synapses there are neurons which are connected to 150000 synapses so the range is quite uh, i mean quite huge but on an average every neuron is connected to roughly 10000 synapses 10 to the power 4 number of synapses okay so 10 to the power 11 that is 100 billion neurons and each neuron is connected to 10 to the power 4 that 10000 synapses okay so brain can be thought of as a uh, as a neural network or graph whatever you may like to call it with 10 to the power 11 number of nodes and 10 to the power 15 number of edges okay so we are so far we are talking about one neuron and few synapses now we are going to talk about the whole brain the whole network which is the realm of study of the system neuroscience okay so how to i mean how the whole brain is modeled and what it does so there are many i mean many models at the ensemble level that is the uh, whole whole brain network level here i have chosen just one that is a mouse model a mouse brain has been modeled which is but relatively easier mouse brain has been modeled and data is nowadays freely available there is an institute called allen institute of brain science it's in uh, seattle in us okay so allen institute of brain science they have profiled the entire mouse brain and uploaded the data in open access form anybody can access it. so entire mouse brain data is available from allen uh, allen institute website so anybody can can download that data and develop various modeling of uh, mouse brain and various tasks of mouse brain okay 
So one group in France, they, they came up with this model. This model is basically the data of the mouse brain that has been collected through DTI. DTI means diffusion tensor imaging, which basically gives you the connectivity, how different neurons are connected to each other. That, that particular network, that connection graph, that is given by DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. Okay. So from DTI data, you are making the mouse brain, the structure of mouse brain, and then of that structure, different functions are being uh, replicated. Okay. So once you get the brain structure, the brain is ready, you start virtually generating different functions. Okay. So in this particular model, the, the focus of study was how the functions of the mouse brain alter over the time. That is over the, the time the mouse remains alive, the aging brain, as the brain is growing older, the mouse is growing older, the brain is going, growing older, this model was made to predict how the brain is going to function over the ages. Because of various age related changes, how the functions of the brain going to be affected. Okay, so that was the aim of this study. So mouse brain was modeled and various brain functions were also simulated and they were compared with the actual brain functions of the mouse. Okay. So here is the model, here is the model and here the comparison has been made. So the result turned out to be quite satisfactory. Okay. I, I took it from the paper that I, I already mentioned here. Sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is the, so this is one, uh, I mean, this has been done for mouse brain. One day it would be possible for human brain also. So that is one step towards that direction. So this is, uh, I mean, to, to uh, underscore the importance of the whole brain modeling that how it can help the, the research as well as treatment. If you know the, if you, by modeling, if you know the cause of aging, then you will be able to address it by uh, therapeutic, uh, therapeutic intervention more efficiently, right? So for that purpose also, and also, of course, there is another purpose of uh, uh, making intelligent machine for which also you, you, you need to know the, the brain uh, very minutely. Now, I would like to draw your attention to a neuroscience versus computer science, how neuroscience progressed and that computed to computer science. And as computer science progressed, that also helped uh, to uh, further progress neuroscience. Okay. So there is a big list and all these I gave reference to. So this is a paper in Nature uh, in, in 2019. So you will see, one of the, I mean, earliest discoveries that is Hape's rule of uh, synaptic strength, etc. So that when uh, when the neuron uh, model was discovered, I mean, neurons are, are uh, firing as firing nerve cells, but they, they are firing electrical potential, and by transmission of those potentials, the nerve cells are communicating among each other. Once this was established. I mean, 
quite, quite a few decades after, the first uh, simulated neuron came into being in 1943. Okay. In 1943, the uh, neuron was first simulated in computer in a very simplistic way, just as a firing cell. Okay. So in a very simplistic way, the neuron was uh, simulated in computer and it was seen that by one single neuron, by one single neuron, you can classify few points which are already linearly separable. You can separate them by a straight line, by one single neuron. So one single neuron works as a linear classifier. That is by one single neuron, you can separate a mixture of two different kinds of data which are already linearly separable. Okay, so if you put multiple neurons together, make a network, then it becomes even more powerful a classifier, which eventually gives us neural network. So the concept came in 1943 and it was inspired by the firing of neurons. Just firing cells, firing nerve cells, that's it. You don't need anything else. So you can see here, uh, I mean, various developments, which, uh, which actually, uh, you know, uh, helped us understand the brain side by side computer together. I mean, understanding the brain and in improving the computer, improving the computer, then understanding the brain. So that went on side by side. Okay. So here, we can, uh, I mean, uh, we can see that how uh, different domains are overlapping with each other. That is computational neuroscience, uh, cognitive science, and artificial intelligence. So in, in, in the Venn diagram form, you'll be able to understand it like this. This is computational neuroscience, and this is cognitive science, and this is artificial intelligence. They are overlapping like this. Okay. That there are overlaps and there are, I mean, individual regions also, there is no overlap. Okay. So it's natural that when progress made in one, in one area, it also made progress in the other areas. And this way, the modern information technology is progressing very rapidly. So modern information technology is not just modern, it is not just, uh, I mean, electronics and information technology alone, but it is adequately supported by cognitive science as well as neuroscience. Okay. So that is the key that has to be understood. It is a very highly interdisciplinary area, not just electronics or mathematics alone. Lot of biology, lot of psychology are also involved. So next we try to understand the whole brain, how the whole brain work, uh, and how the whole brain works at a uh, very, you know, general general level at a very general level not at the level of the minute detail of how each cell is working cells are working i mean chemical electrical working are going on i mean continuously going on okay but but i mean taking all this together the overall functioning of the brain the overall functioning of the brain how that works, that we are trying to understand. So that we can, I mean, we, we can understand 
as a layered process. So the lowest layer at the at the at the lowest level, we don't even uh, consciously feel uh, feel it. There are many things happening in our brain which we are not aware of, which we are not even aware of. For example, when you are sleeping, your brain never sleeps. Even when you are sleeping, your brain is very active. It has been studied. I mean, by imaging the sleeping brain, when the person is sleeping, it's all, always possible to put uh, electrode, I mean, touched on the surface of the brain, the person is sleeping, the electrodes touched on the surface of the brain and electrical signals being monitored. Those are called EEG signals, okay. Signals being monitored and uh, by, by analyzing those signals, it can be seen the brain is, uh, I mean, very active at that time. <clears throat> and uh, you'll be surprised to know when we are at the deepest sleep, sleep has different types of uh, different forms, okay. So there are four or five different forms of sleep, uh, uh, sleep is, uh, are there. Four, uh, four, four, four different forms of sleep are there, okay. So all the forms happen in the night, one after another. The deepest sleep, when our brain is, is, is supposed to be at, at most inactive, I mean, when our brain is supposed to be the, the most inactive, at that time, the electrical signals that is emanated from the brain is very similar to electrical signal emanated from a, from a I mean, conscious person. The person is, is awake and active. That person's electrical signal and a person who is in deepest sleep, they're very similar. That means the brain working has not reduced. The working of brain is still very much active. Okay. But you are not aware of it. Mostly, I mean, you can dream at that time, but most dreams we don't remember. That is the stage where we dream, but most dreams we don't even remember. Okay, so that is one good example that there are many things happening in our brain which we are not aware, not even aware of. So that is the lowest level of consciousness you can say. Okay, then there are many levels of consciousness where you are not aware of. The highest level is the level that you are very much aware of and you are acting on. So in the highest level, what you are doing, you are getting sensory perception. Sensory perception means uh, we have five senses, vision, audition, olfaction, that is smell, uh, somato sensation, that is touch, and gastration, that is taste. Okay. So five senses we have, five senses are processed in five different parts of the brain. And through these five senses, we sense the environment, we take input from the environment, we take input signals from the environment. And those signals are immediately processed in the brain. Then when you are processing those signals, you're constantly recalling your past memory. You're constantly recalling your past memory, for example, when you are uh, seeing a, a, a new bird, you constantly recalling what type of birds you know. So that what type of birds you have seen in the past and you match with them, you see that no, this bird you have never seen. This is a very novel type of bird. Then you store the memory of that bird again in your, in your memory. Okay. So that, that keeps happening all the time. When we are doing something, we are constantly recalling the past memory. So those memories are coming from the lower level, lower, lower brain levels. I mean, these are all functional levels, not structural. These are all functional levels. So these are all modulated by electrical, chemical, electrical, chemical processes. And then the working memory. Working memory is of course very important. I mean, working memory, not just for addition of uh, numbers, but working memory is needed every time. I mean, for example, when you are, uh, I mean, climbing down through staircase, you have to be careful, right? You have to be careful. You have to be notice the. Uh, you have to notice uh, the the depth of the, sta the steps and uh, uh, 
I mean, uh, how slippery they are or how small they are, whether you will be properly able to put your foot on or not, that you have to take care of, okay? So each time you are, you are taking a new step, you, you have to carefully look at it and map the, I mean, that particular surface in your brain, understand the, how you are going to take your step. So all these are part of your working memory. So every time, every small task that we do, we need to recall our, I mean, we need to form our working memory. So the working memory will, we will be completely at our conscious, you know, at our, at, at our conscious state. That, uh, that is the state when we are doing something, we are very much awake, we are very much, uh, I mean, aware of what we are doing. So these things will be at the highest level of brain functioning. The task immediately at hand. Okay. So these are the slow process. The, the lower you go, the process is slower and mostly chemical. Chemical processes are what, what is happening. Chemical processes are slower, much slower than electrical processes. But Chemical processes are very versatile. Electrical processes, I mean, it's not possible to bring as much versatility in electrical process, in electrical processes as it is possible in the chemical processes. Chemical processes have so many different types of chemicals are there. So many different chemical processes are there. So chemical processes are very versatile. They are giving diversity. And electrical processes are giving you speed. So these two are combining in, in, in right way in order to give rise to the normal brain functions. So as lower you go, you have predominantly chemical processes. And as higher you go, you need to make very quick decision. You make, make, uh, need to make very quick formations. So there the, the uh, processes are predominantly electrical. Okay. I see some questions and chats. I'll take them. Okay. I'll take them after immediately after I finish the talk, I'll take them. Now this, this leveled brain functioning, what it is doing, it is giving a notion of deep neural network, there is a deep learning, the basis of deep learning. Okay, so deep learning is the most flourishing branch of artificial intelligence today. And of course, most, most uh, uh, flourishing branch of machine learning also. So deep learning is basically neural network with multiple hidden layers. So every neural network, as you all know, must have two layers. One is input layer, another is output layer. There are neural networks which have only input and output layers, no, no other layers are there. But often there are neural networks with hidden layers. Any layer between input and output layer is called hidden layer. As we all know that uh, with neural network with only one hidden layer can approximate any function, can approximate any continuous function, okay. So it's an universal approximator. If there are two or more hidden layers, you can call it a deep learning network. If the number of hidden layers is two or more, I saw in some review paper, okay. So if the number of paper, the number of layers in a neural network, two or more, you can call it a deep, I mean, a deep neural network or deep learning neural network. Okay. So deep learning neural networks are particularly successful in image classification, computer vision, image classification, et cetera. So they, they are uh, the principal areas of uh, application of deep learning neural network. Deep learning neural network typically comes with uh, a few convolution layers. Convolution means uh, they are basically uh, feature extractors. Mm, for example, convolution 
you can say the Fourier transformation is a convolution operation. Fourier transformation is a convolution operation. It's basically uh, doing a convolution operation with the signal that you are fitting with the Fourier uh, components. That is cos n theta plus i sin n theta, et cetera, et cetera. Cos n t plus sin n t, you can say not theta, but, but take it as t, that will be more convenient. Okay, so that, that you would do the convolution operation and, and for each n, you are getting one particular component. Okay, so those components are features. So by Fourier transformation, what you are, uh, you are getting, you are getting certain features of the signal. Okay, similarly, you can do the convolution operation of particular functions or you can, you can do a series of weights. Okay, you can do this with any input, any data input, convolution operation, you can do that way. And you, I mean, generate the, you, you extract the features from the data, okay. So once we extract the features through layers of convolution uh, layers, the, through convolution layers, then comes the actual processing of those features for purpose of classification or whatever. Those are undertaken in, uh, in, in the recurrent neural network. What is the recurrent neural network? Now where the connections between the layers are feed forward as well as feedback. Normally we know only feed forward connection. That is from layer N, the uh, input is, is or, or, or the signal is transmitting from layer N to layer N plus one, not the other way down. But in recurrent neural network, the signal will also travel from layer N plus one to layer N, the previous layer. They are particularly powerful, uh, I mean, neural network powerful classifier. Here you can see every layer is joined with the next layer with feed forward and feedback connections. That is information is flowing in both ways between the layers. And that is, that gives a very powerful computing machine in our brain. Okay. So here also it is mimicked, not in the, uh, I mean, convolutional layer, of course, but in the, in the, you can say executing layers where you are actually performing the classification task or whatever task the neural network is supposed to do. There, this feed forward and feedback connections, having them together, makes the net particularly powerful. So we'll end with an example of, so, so far we, we, we talked about how the notion of uh, brain helped building the deep learning neural network, I mean, deep learning algorithms, okay. I'll give you an example how the deep learning helped to understand the brain. So, Deep learning is one, I mean, one thing I, I need to emphasize, the deep learning has enabled us to analyze images, to understand images in a way which was not possible earlier. Images are resolved into features in an unprecedented way by deep learning neural network particularly the convolutional neural network. Okay, it's an unprecedented, unprecedentedly powerful algorithm, powerful mechanism. Okay. So that has been utilized in the brain image. So here you can see it's, a, it's an image of cortex, the gray matter, the So take an image of this cortex, the wrinkled surface, okay. And analyze that, that image to understand certain characteristics of the brain. 
So there is a study, a very recent paper of uh, 2021 origin, a very recent paper reported a very interesting fact. By analyzing this, this sulcus gyra structure, the wrinkle structure of the brain, it is possible to tell number one age of the person, number two sex of the person. It's quite remarkable. Because why remarkable? Just give, uh, uh, let me give you an example. Even the best neuroscientist in the world, if you, I mean, extract brains from two bodies, say a man and woman of same age from the same ethnic group, say they are either, uh, say from uh, either French or maybe Punjabi or whoever, whatever, okay. So they are coming from same ethnic group and they are of same age. If the, after, after they die, if the brains are taken away from the body and given at the hand of the best neurosurgeon in the world, he or she will not be able to tell which is a male brain and which is a female brain. They are anatomically so identical. But the new research tells us that it is possible by analyzing this wrinkled structure of the brain to say what is the sex of the person. It's quite, quite a, I mean, you know, exciting uh, research, exciting report, which I have not seen before. So here is a report that, uh, that uh, I mean, uh, I'm trying to show here. So first, this from the brain image, the brain's, I mean, exact structure, the ge geometric structure of the brain is to be extracted. There, there is a software for that, called free software software. It is freely available. There is a software for that. So in that software, the, the network has been, uh, I mean, the cortical surface has been, uh, I mean, formed by this triangular structure. It's part of computational geometry, okay. So I'll not go into the detail. So this way, the surface has been formed. Basically, it's a graphical structure. Basically, it's a graphical structure. Okay, as you can see here, as you can see here. So this structure has been extracted from each of the brains and analyzed. After doing the analysis, the result is like this. Okay, 6,410 healthy subjects obtained from 11 publicly available data repositories were used for analysis. It's quite a large number, 6,410 brains have been analyzed this way. Age, the, the ages of the persons whose brain uh, structure has been analyzed, the, the age ranges from six to 89 years. A geometric convolutional neural network, that's a deep learning neural network, okay. So GCNN, has been employed to classify those brain structures, to classify those brain images, okay. Was able to predict the subject sex with an average accuracy of 87.99%. Quite high, almost 88%. With 88% accuracy, the deep learning neural network is able to say the sex of the subject, six of the person whose brain has been imaged. Whereas, as I told you, the best neurosurgeon who knows the structure of the brain better than anyone else, the best neurosurgeon won't be able to tell between two brains from same ethnic group of same age persons, which brain is a male brain, which brain is a female brain. The deep learning neural network is able to do that. So powerful. And when it's predicting the age of the person, it is 
making the net the, the, the network is making an error only of plus minus 4.58 years. Either 4.58 years lesser age or 4.58 years more age. Okay. So that is the power of deep learning neural network. And that is one example, one very good example of how deep learning neural network can help us understanding the brain even better. So brain inspired artificial intelligence. Now artificial intelligence is helping us to understand brain better. With this, I finish the talk. Thank you, sir, uh, for introducing us to nerve cells, their characteristics and uh, briefing us about intelligent computation, neuronal firing, uh, differentiating between neuroscience and computer science, and also giving us an introduction about deep learning. I'm sure we all have a lot to take back from this lecture. Uh, there are a few questions, sir. I'll just read out to you. Okay. Uh, there is one question from uh, Dr. Meenakshi Malhotra from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. She says, uh, thank you for the session. It was very informative. I have my research in neurocognitive model for knowledge that includes Hebbian learning and homeostasis. Her first Which question factor? is... Which factor? Uh, Hebbian learning and... Yeah, that I understand. Uh, I'm not sure of that. I think she'll type okay, let, that me, let, let, let me let let me check the chat. Yes. Yeah. And her question is, uh, how can we the relate? Ah, uh, yes. What are the okay? Let me check. Abian learning and homeostasis. Okay. Abian learning and homeostasis. Okay. My first uh, her first question is, how can we relate? Consciousness at the neuronal level. Uh, the answer is I don't know. Uh, I mean, it's it's a hotly debated area. How can we relate consciousness at the neuronal level? No, it is. I mean, very little is known about it. Neural underpinning of consciousness. The best thing that are known are uh, sensory awareness. Okay, so how? I mean, neuronal underpinning of vision, audition, olfaction, they are understood quite well, but not consciousness. In fact, the definition of consciousness is not uh, universally agreed upon. What is consciousness and what is not, even that is not very clear. A lot of research is going on, but it's still an ill-defined, in-studied area we, I mean, our, our basic understanding is quite vague. At neuronal level, the, I mean, as I told that, uh, it is the sensory awareness that is understood uh, well, but not, uh, I mean, uh, things like when you are meditating or when you are, trying to solve a mathematical problem, or when you are uh, maybe thinking of committing a suicide, what, I mean, what is their neuronal underpinning is, uh, I mean, is yet to be known. Thank you, sir. Second question is, what are the neuronal bases for transfer for working or short-term memory to long-term memory? Yeah, that, uh, that area is, uh, See, first we'll have to distinguish between short-term and long-term memory. Again, uh, this is not very precisely uh, demarcated, but if you go through the book uh, of Christoph Koch, it is 1999 book published by Oxford University Press. It is called uh, Biophysics of Neuron. Okay, Biophysics of Neurons, very famous book. So in that book, what I studied, I just, I'll just tell you that, that Whatever you do not remember beyond 15 minutes is definitely part of your short-term memory. Whatever you can remember for more than two hours is definitely part of your long-term memory. But in between 15 minutes and two hours, there's a gray area. 
whether whatever you remember within one hour, whether it is long-term memory, short-term memory is not very clear. Okay, as demarcated like this, let me tell you that short-term memory, short-term memory is relieved by, I mean, uh, 15 minutes or uh, maybe uh, uh, half an hour. It is believed to be kept alive by firing of neurons. The neurons in the prefrontal cortex, that is the frontal part of the cortex that I showed you, which is the house of the working memory, that prefrontal cortex in the network, certain neurons will have to keep firing. I also showed you one, uh, one image of, uh, I mean, neuronal basis of working memory. So working memory is a typical short-term memory, right? So neuronal firing alone is capable of keeping your short-term memory alive. But long-term memory, for long-term memory, you need structural or anatomical modification in your brain. As I talked about the, the brain network, okay? So brain network is uh, consisting of 10 to the power of human brain, 10 to the power 11 number of neurons and of the order of 10 to the power 15 number of synapses. So for long-term memory preservation, you need to form either new synapse or need to strengthen the already existing synapse for which you need to synthesize new protein. Brain will have to be able to synthesize new protein. Exactly how the protein synthesis takes place that I'm forgetting and, and that's not my area, but if you are really interested, you please uh, follow Eric Kandel's work. He got Nobel Prize for formation of long-term memory. Uh, he's uh, researched for many decades on formation of long-term memory. Uh, he got Nobel Prize in 2000. So particularly read his uh, Nobel lecture, which was published in Science. Uh, after uh, that, I think 2000 or 2001, his uh, paper was published in Science's Nobel lecture, which itself is very illuminating. There he showed that uh, he, he, all his life, he worked not on human brain, but on brain of Appalachia. Appalachia is a kind of sea snail. It's available in the Californian coast. Okay. So, so, I mean, large amount of molecular and cellular level research on the brain has been conducted on invertebrate animals. One advantage of it is that in invertebrates, the nerve cells are simpler, number one. The, I mean, nervous system network, the entire network is simpler. Number of nerve cells are lesser. The nerve cells are much larger. Mammalian nerve cells, the human nerve cells, human brain nerve cells are very complicated. They're much smaller, more complicated. Uh, so compared to that, if you study the nerve cells of insects, lobsters, or snails, okay, those nerve cells are much bigger, much simpler. So his entire research was concentrated on Appalachia, a kind of sea snail with large nerve cells and roughly about probably 20,000 neurons. So they have much simpler, you know, neural networks. So, uh, I mean, he, he showed that a particular type of protein is being synthesized in order to preserve short-term memory as long-term. So structural change in brain needs to happen in order to uh, make your, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in order to preserve your short-term memory into the long-term form. She also wants to know your viewpoint on theoretical neuroscience approach that integrates the connectionist model and rule-based models into the field of AI. Uh, which which neuroscience? Uh, so you okay? View, view, theoretical neuroscience approach that integrates the connectionist model, neural network, and rule-based model, okay. symbolic reasoning into field of AI. I mean, uh, connectionist model, see the rule-based neural network means you can, you can form an expert system, for example, and you can 
come up with rules. For example, diagnostic system. You know that certain disease, it has certain symptoms and based on certain symptoms, you diagnose the disease. So you can also, I mean, it's quite possible. It's quite possible. And I think this type of uh, softwares are already available. There are many diseases which uh, have very routine, uh, I mean, symptoms. And if you see certain things, you ask certain very specific question to the patient. And patient gives some yes, no answer or some a little more uh, elaborate answers. So those answers are also very routine. So if you have a repository of all these and if you can relate one to the other, you can certainly be, I mean, you can certainly be able to form a knowledge database in which all the options can be accommodated. Okay. So now you, you acquaint the, this database with a neural network. I mean, you acquaint a neural network with this database. You train a neural network on this database, quite possible. So once you give the input to this network from the patient in terms of diagnosis, the network can ask, uh, I mean, simple questions like, uh, a simple question, I mean, which will be, uh, you know, querying your, your symptoms, querying out your symptoms. Okay. So network will ask you simple question through a robotic voice or whatever. So simple question and you, you keep answering by, 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 by your voice. And it will, uh, with, a, uh, with a speech analyzer, it will understand what you are saying. And it will feed into the neural network. Neural network will access the database through which it will make the diagnosis through the expert system, which it has already learned. And then we'll give you the uh, kind of advice that an expert clinician, an expert clinician will uh, give you. That is quite possible. Thank you, sir. There's another question from Dr. Shaila. Is there any relation between the age factor and working memory of the brain? She means yes. To, yeah, she wants to say, uh, does as age increases, uh, does the memory uh, functioning will be less? Ah, is there any relation between age factor and working memory of the brain? Yes. As you age, your space for working memory shifts. There is very uh, specific research article on that. You can search in Google Scholar. Uh, just go to, go to, I mean, just call scholar.google.com and uh, search uh, age working memory. Just give these three, uh, three keyword, age working memory. That's it. You will get, I mean, a host of articles. Thank you, sir. As you age, your working memory and space for your working memory shrinks down. And also keep in mind uh, that we are, we are born with some 10 to the power 11 number of neurons though. Every day, seven and thousands of neurons are dying every day. Now you will be able to uh, do a very uh, quick arithmetic to see, even if you live for 100 years, only a few crores of neurons will, will be dead. So that's nothing. And also keep in mind, adult neurogenesis does not happen in, in higher animals like humans. Whatever neurons you are born with, you have to live with. Many neurons will die in course of your life, but new neurons are not generated. There are some exceptions in hippocampus area in our brain, adult neurogenesis has been reported, but that's a very uh, limited, uh, very limited area. Okay, so as a result of neurons are dying and also various uh, other, uh, I mean, biochemical changes, the, the memory that we already have, that we keep losing. Not only memory, the other activities, the other intelligent activity, ability for other intelligent activities, we may keep losing. Of course, this loss is different in different persons. Some persons you will see even at age of 90 has a very sharp brain, very good memory. And somebody maybe at even 60s losing memory, I mean, suffering from dementia. It depends on the, it depends very much on the 
uh, I mean, anatomy and physiology of that particular person. It depends on a lot of genetic factors. So there's another question from Gagana. What is your opinion on structure and function coupling in the brain? How strong is this coupling? How does one affect another? Coupling is very strong. I mean, the brain function depends quite a lot on brain structure. And if your brain structure changes, of course, function will change. So, uh, I mean, how do I say? For example, uh, certain neurotransmitters, certain proteins, okay, so they are contributing in structure of your brain. And how those neurotransmitters, those proteins will be synthesized in your brain depends on your gene, the kind of genetic material that you inherited from your parents, right? So it, it may happen that certain proteins you are, I mean, synthesizing too much, a little too much, not much, a little too much. That may create certain chemicals in your brain, which will make you more angry than the others. Uh, I mean, you have huge amount of anger. Okay. That's not good for health. That's not good for your intelligence also. But it is there in your in your in your brain. You can't help because you inherited it genetically. So that is, I mean, structure means not just the physiological structure, but structure of biochemical composition. That also you have to think of. So Dr. Shaila has another question. Like Braco and Rekai, are there still any specific regions existing in the brain for specific region, uh, reasons? Are there still any specific regions that are still like many, many, many? Uh, so I can I can I can go back to this. Uh, so this is a broad man's area, right? So these you can say, they say this, this 44, 45, they are Broca's region, okay? And this is 22 is the Reynica's region, right? So apart from that, for example, uh, which one? So here you see this one, uh, this one is this side is your, motor region, motor cortex, and that side is your uh, somatosensory cortex. That is, you are, you are processing your touch here. Your motor functions, that is, you want to raise your hand, you want to kick a football. These are coming from, these are coming from these regions. Okay. Sorry, uh, I mean, I mean, sorry, sorry. I just uh, told you it other way down. So this is somewhat a sensory, you see? This is somewhat a sensory. This is your touch. This is your touch, touch, touch region, and this is your motor region. Okay, so you, you want to raise your hand. For example, you're writing something. You are writing something. So this region is taking care of how you are writing A, how you're writing B, how you're writing C. Okay, so this region is taking care of. And this is somatosensory region, okay. That means uh, you, are, you, are, um, you are examining somebody, say, say you are a doctor, you are examining someone's pulse. So how you are feeling the pulse of that person with your thumb, that is being, that is being controlled, that is being monitored by this region of the brain. Okay, this is the region where your vision is processed, vision is being processed uh, in this vast region. Vision means whatever you are seeing, your eyes are in the front, okay. But whatever you are seeing by your eyes, directly transmitted all the way back to your brain. So this is the region, the most backward region. That is the region where your vision is being processed first 
That region is called V1 or the striate cortex. Okay, where exactly what you are seeing that that is being processed there right away. So your, um, I mean, uh, whether the, I mean, something is reclined or straight. Okay, so so those things are being processed in the most backward part of the brain. There are many. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Debanjali has a question. Is there any relationship between uh, gene mutation, neuronal function, and brain development? Of course, yes. Because gene mutation will, uh, I mean, will affect your protein synthesis, your not, I mean, of course, uh, that, uh, not all gene mutations will affect your brain. Brain needs lots of protein. For example, two very prominent protein, the neurotransmitters, they're basically proteins. One is GABA, another is glutamate. So GABA is called the inhibitory neurotransmitter in our brain. Glutamate is called excitatory neurotransmitter in brain. In the sense, GABA neurotransmitter makes the neurons fire. Glutamate neurotransmitter makes the neurons not to fire. If some firing neuron is applied with GABA, then that neuron will stop firing. If a, a, a neuron which is silent is uh, given, uh, I mean, glutamate, the neuron will start firing. I mean, it's rough understanding of that. I'm not going into the detail, it's a rough understanding of that. The, there are two different kinds, and these two are the most major neurotransmitters in our brain, they're chemicals. They are being secreted by the neurons, okay? There are specific neurons which secrete GABA, there are specific neurons which secrete glutamate. Okay, so imagine that, and, and both have to be synthesized. GABA and glutamate, they have to be constantly being synthesized, constantly being, supplied to the brain. That depends on the genetic factor of your gene, okay? So there are specific proteins which the gene, uh, I mean, synthesizes. From gene, the proteins come, okay? So now if you're, uh, if, if this happens, that genetically, you are synthesizing more glutamate, excessive glutamate, then your brain, may sometimes, I mean, not all the times, but sometimes you are synthesizing, accidentally synthesizing excess glutamate. Then your brain may, I mean, maybe uh, brain neurons may be firing excessively. And that will be a pathological condition. You will lose your consciousness. That typically happens when you are being, I mean, struck by epilepsy. The, uh, I mean, it's a seizure. I mean, you lose consciousness, may fall down may uh, I mean, uh, what is it, salivate from your mouth, okay, may have jerking in your limbs, involuntary jerking. So that's a very debilitating disease. I mean, if it happens during the drive, driving or when you are working in front of a machine or cooking in front of fire, so it can, it can cause anything, it, it can cause death. Thank you, sir. Uh, it looks like these are the only questions that people had to ask. Uh, it was a wonderful session, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much once again. Uh, thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. K.N.B. Murthy. He's also the chairman of BITES for always introducing us to such eminent uh, speakers through the DGL series. Uh, thanks also to uh, Sri M.N. Vidya Shankar, chairman by co-chairman BITES, for always encouraging such lectures. Also, thanks to our uh, registrar, Dr. Puttamadappa, Dean Dr. Srinivas, Dean Research, uh, Dr. M.K. Banga, Assistant Registrar, Dr. Anupama, for always supporting us and motivating us to attend uh, such talks. Uh, sir, uh, do you want to talk something? Vice Chancellor, sir? Yeah, nothing, nothing. I think I just wanted to thank uh... Professor Koshik Mujumdar for an excellent you, uh, topic. I, I joined very late, sir, because I had another meeting. I just uh, I came when the, the Q&A was going on. And thanks for uh, uh, taking time of your busy schedule to be with us. Request you to consider delivering one more lecture at a later date.
Yeah, okay. That may be a shot. Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you, sir. Banga, sir? Do you want to say? Yeah. Uh, we have an excellent and very informative uh, session. Uh, in fact, uh, all of you have to understand also how uh, uh, brain is functioning. And Professor has given it very nicely as to how it functions. And uh, he has also given uh, the function of the brain. I think it is his new research work. Uh, sir, I cannot hear you. Sir, I cannot hear you. Your voice is not very, uh, I mean, understandable. Yeah. Uh, what is an audible? An audible yeah. Yeah, now better. Now it's better. Uh, in fact, it was a very illuminating and very informative session. I used to wonder as to how the entire uh, brain functioning. And you have given very clearly in a lucid manner as to uh, how the uh, brain functions. And you also talked about a layer uh, functioning of the brain. I think it is your uh, new research. And uh, I saw unpublished of your work being uh, discussed. And, uh, uh, and also your example of, uh, you know, finding out the age and the set of two subjects, uh, that was really great, sir. And uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 your voice is choking too much. <laughs> I think there is some problem with my mind. No, it's choking too much. Okay. Now, the example that you have cited, was really in a very you know informative uh, uh, point okay. of the yeah finding the gender and the uh, uh, age of uh, two subjects uh, was yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. quite uh, excellent yeah 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 it was exciting to me also actually I found it only last night in the last moment I last moment I I added that slide I was I was I, I myself was quite excited but because uh, so far, uh, my understanding was that anatomically, I mean, there are a lot of uh, ideas earlier uh, in, in say 100 years ago or more, uh, various scientists, they uh, extracted brain from uh, human corpses, okay. So male brain, female brain, they extracted and weighed them and uh, then determined, okay, uh, female brain is, is lighter, I mean, slightly less in weight, so uh, females have lesser intelligent, I mean, lesser intelligence, that type of conclusion they reached. But uh, soon after, I mean, more careful study revealed that anatomically they are identical. Anatomically they are identical. I mean, uh, there is almost no difference. But this is also true, although they are anatomically identical. This is also true, I must say. When female brain and male brain, they start functioning, they are as different as the male and female sex organs. They're very different. The functioning is very different. So, but I mean, come back to, to the uh, uh, I mean, context that, that you were talking about. Uh, it, was, it was quite exciting uh, to me to know that from brain structure, it's possible to determine the sex. And it has been uh, possible by the, I mean, deep neural network architecture. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, let me thank uh, Vaisandala Saraji, thank you. Let me thank uh, Aunt Yoko, you know, uh, Vice Penda, uh, Danasari University. Uh, for taking time off to be with us for almost you now two of us. And uh, as Vaishana said, we will have uh, one more interaction and uh, uh, session by you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Can I leave now? Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you.